things brought to know thee and to have fellowship with thee and to walk with thee and to count on thee in every circumstance of life. We're living down at what we believe to be the last days of our pilgrimage here in this world. And everywhere we look, things don't look that good. But oh Lord, when we think of what's ahead in the glory with thee, we take courage. And so we ask this afternoon as we open thy word that thou wouldst uh, be able to guide us by thy spirit. We confess, Father, the weakness of the human vessel but we know that thy spirit is not limited. And so we pray that in spite of us, thou it's bless. We pray and give thanks as we open thy word in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I would like to go to the epistle of 2 Timothy. I want to do a brief Repass of the epistle, not in any extensive way, but picking up on things that have been a tremendous encouragement to my own soul, and I want to share them with you all. Remember, Timothy evidently was a young man. He says in the first epistle, let no one despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. So he was a youth. I don't know what that means, what uh, kind of age he might have had. But he was a young man in comparison to the Apostle Paul, who took him and wanted him to come with him. I must say, brethren, it has been a very great blessing in my own life to have an Eric Smith, a Ramon Alarcon, a Clem Cannon that have asked me to accompany them. You know, discipleship is not only learning by what is taught, but it is learning by example. And I must say, I treasure in my soul the memory of how they handled situations. So here we have Timothy with the Apostle Paul, and 2 Timothy is the last of his writings. In the fourth chapter, he says, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I think it is so interesting. Is Paul discouraged? Well, let's see here in chapter 1, let's start there. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to D Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Here's something mentioned in this chapter I just want to focus on a bit. He talks about a pure conscience. We don't have time to go back to 1 Timothy, but in 1 Timothy in two separate verses, he talks about a good conscience. Maintaining faith and a good conscience. How important it is, the question of your conscience. You know what your conscience is tells you about. And Paul says here in 2 Timothy, I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. Notice, he doesn't say a good conscience, a pure conscience. Because Paul, even when he was not a believer in the Lord Jesus, he was doing what he thought was right. It was a pure conscience, but it wasn't a good conscience. Because as he watched them stoning Stephen to death, and his face shining like an angel's. The Lord Jesus said to him a little later, he says, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The pricks of conscience came into his soul. He must have thought, 
what is going on? At least he had what is called a pure conscience, but it's important to maintain a good conscience. You know what conscience is. It's that which is in every human being, even little children. You know, sometimes in a home, a mother might say to a little child, don't you touch that vase on that table. And uh, the child, wandering around, goes up to that table, looks around at his mom, see if his mom's watching before he wants to touch that vase. Why does he do that? His conscience. Conscience is what man did not have before the fall in the Garden of Eden. He was innocent, means without the knowledge of good and evil. But when he ate of the tree that was forbidden, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, immediately they knew that they were naked and they hid themselves. What was it? Conscience. And you and I have conscience. Paul says in the book of the Acts, herein, do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man? He doesn't say I always have a good conscience. No. I exercise myself. It's a continual daily exercise. Don't ignore the voice of conscience. Is there something in your life right now that you know is not right and you're just trying to push it off into a corner? Listen to the voice of your conscience. Somebody has said a conscience is a good policeman. It's not a good guide because conscience operates according to the measure of light it has. I have good eyes. I can see you all out there. But if it was all dark in here, I could hear some noises around. I could guess there might be some people in here. But it's when somebody switches on the light, then I can see you. That's the way conscience is. It's the light of the Word of God that makes conscience work properly. And so the Lord help us to be reading the Word, especially you young people. Be encouraged to take time to read the Word. It's the light. And that way you will know what is good and what is not good. That's so important in our lives. Exercise yourself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Now we go on, verse 4. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Isn't this nice to see that Timothy had a grandmother and a mother that had real faith. And in chapter 3 it says that from a child, he had known the Holy Scriptures. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So important for those who are parents to let their children hear. hear. Read it. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't say faith comes by explaining the Word of God. No. It's by hearing the Word of God. That's so important. that thou stir up the gift of God which is in me by the putting on of my hands. I love that. Timothy had a gift. We don't know exactly what his gift might have been. 
Chapter 4, he says, do the work of an evangelist. He didn't say, Timothy, you're an evangelist. No, just do that work. And, you know, you and I can always give out a gospel tract or a calendar or whatever. And perhaps speak a word. There are those who are gifted. That's event. But he was told to do the work of an evangelist. I don't know what his gift may have been, but he's told to stir up the gift of God. And the Spanish translation is wake up. And I think some of our gifts are dormant. And that to me really concerns me because I see in here so many young people that are coming along. Are you aware of the fact that God has given you a specific gift for the blessing of others? That's what he does in the body of Christ. And each one has one. It's very clear in Scripture. We have the gifts mentioned in Romans chapter 12, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and in Ephesians chapter 4. We don't have time to go to those Scriptures, but in each place it says very clearly that each one has a gift. Are you using that gift? What are you going to do? You get before the judgment seat of Christ, and the Lord said, I give you a gift. Uh, how did you use that? I didn't even realize that yet. Are you going to say that? It's kind of late to say that. It's now you want to wake up as That's to the gift that, that the Lord, Lord has given, given you. And I, I say, I see certain, certain young people starting to exercise their gift. You know, gift is something that is developed with the use. And so be exercised. Remember, Chuck Hendricks was asked one time, how can I know what gift I have? His answer was, I'll just say what Mary, the mother of Jesus, said to the servants at the wedding feast. Whatever he says unto you, do it. So be exercised before the Lord. If the Lord puts something on your heart, do it. Because that's the way gift will be developed in time. I felt that was a good answer. The thing is to be exercised, not dormant. You know, if it's dormant, you're just not doing anything. May the Lord help us, dear, especially I say to my dear young brothers and sisters. I've seen some of them. When the Lord turns on the switch, I don't know how it happens exactly, but oh, the blessing that there can be. I had a brother in the south of Bolivia. He got saved when he was probably in his 20s. And he had never gone to school at all. He didn't even know how to read. But in his intense desire to read the scriptures he taught himself how to read and that brother turned out to be a blessing in the south of bolivia especially because he knew fluently the quechua indian language which is used in many of the assemblies in southern bolivia oh the way god can use even those that are uneducated look at peter and john and how the multitude uh, marveled that these men were unlearned, unlettered men, and yet God used them in such a marked way. That's our God. He's giving gifts, and you need to stir up the gift of God that's in you. Now verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I think that's so beautiful. You know, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of fear floating around in the United States. Fear of getting sick. Fear of dying. Brethren, the Lord deliver us from that. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm not saying we should be careless in our habits, 
We should be careful. We should take precautions that we can. But don't get under the spirit of fear. It says in 1 John chapter 4 that uh, uh, perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. Oh, brethren, the Lord help us in this. God has given us not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What brother was talking about in the open meeting about the kingdom of God is in power. Oh, it's wonderful to see the spirit of God working. It's not a matter of who I am, brethren. I'm just a nobody. But if the Spirit of God is allowed to operate, there's no telling what might happen. Wonderful. Beautiful. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now he says in verse 8, and I love this, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner. There was Paul in prison in Rome, waiting any day. They were going to take him out to the chopping block Outside, I don't know where it might have been. And he'd have to lay his head down on that chopping block. And the executioner would take his axe. Whack! Paul, aren't you ashamed? Your life is one complete failure. Look at the way as you've lost everything in life. Verse 12, he says, For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless... I am not ashamed. Don't you be ashamed, Timothy, of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. I, I love that. It's so wonderfully beautiful. No, we don't have to be ashamed. The Lord Jesus is not uh, accepted in the world that we live in, but it's not anything that we should be ashamed of. The power of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We're going to be ashamed. That word power really is the dynamite. It is the power of God. And, you know, we often go into prisons to preach the gospel. And I like to think that they put those men in prisons. They enclose them, but they can't change them. The power of God gets inside of those men and changes them from the inside out. And it is amazing what God does in some of those prisons, in their extremity. Nothing to be ashamed of. So it's beautiful here. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the, uh, in verse 12 he says, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded. I, I love that. You know, to be persuaded means you've got some evidence presented to you. And based on that evidence, you have been persuaded. Brethren, are we persuaded? Or is there quite a bit of doubt floating around in our soul? Lord, help us that we too would be persuaded. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. New translation says, my deposit. You know you deposit money in the bank, in a savings account, or whatever. And sometimes a bank fails. And you're going to be ashamed. But there is an account you can deposit into that you will not be ashamed Oh, I want to encourage you, young people, to live in view of that coming day of glory. Deposit your energy, your time, your resources into that heavenly account, that deposit on high. 
You know, I must say, I was really challenged by the life of dear brother Eric Smith. Since we traveled together, he told me a lot about his early years in New Zealand and how his father, who was not a believer, when he learned that Eric Smith had gotten saved and had decided to go to Bolivia as a missionary, he thought it was such a foolish thing. He wanted all his sons, he had quite a few sons, and he wanted them all to prosper in life, to get a good education and to earn good money. And when he learned that that was Eric Smith's uh, decision, he said, if that's your decision, son, get out of my house. You don't have any longer any place in this house. Get out. And he had to get out and make his own way. He studied medicine for two years. In Bolivia, they always called him El Doctor Smith. But uh, he went to Bolivia. Right there in 1921. I went for the first time in 1967 to Peru with him and then to Bolivia in 1968. Brother, when I saw the results of what he had sown in those countries, I said to the Lord, please, Lord, please help me not to be deceived by the material things of this life, but to live for that which is coming. I was able to visit him shortly before he went to be with the Lord in a nursing home in Montreal, Canada. And he couldn't speak anymore. He, he died two days short of his 103rd birthday in 1997. And I must say it was a challenge to me as I walked into the room. He looked at me with those little beady eyes. He couldn't say anything, but I greeted him in Quechua. The only thing I saw is a little nod of the head. A little later, he went into the glory. Brethren, it was such a challenge to me to think of him going into the glory and meeting so many of those Bolivian people that came into the knowledge of the truth of salvation through Christ. That, that again was a tremendous challenge to me, not to focus on things down here that are so soon going to pass away. Paul was not ashamed. Hopefully, we won't be ashamed either. It's interesting there's another man in this chapter that was not ashamed. It's verse uh, 16, Onesiphorus. He was not ashamed of my claim. chain. Beautiful to think about. I want to go on now because quite a few things I want to focus on in chapter 2. Chapter 2 sometimes has been called the Magna Carta of the Christian Testimony in the, pres in the pr present age. But just let me point out two things to me that are, are bulwarks in this chapter. That don't depend on me in any way, but they are bulwarks that you can lay hold of. To me, it is so amazingly wonderful. We're living in days of ruin of the Christian testimony. People look around and say, I don't see that there's just one body of Christians here in this town, there's one body over here and another body over there and another body. What do you mean by there is one body? Well, it's true. The Christian testimony is in ruins. But remember, the truth remains. There is one body. And that truth is as much true today as it was on the day of Pentecost when the church was first formed. How important it is to get those things true. And that one body includes every true believer in the Lord Jesus. Whether they meet with us or not, if they are a real believer, they are part of that one body. And so we are to recognize that precious truth. But I just want to point out these two things that are a bulwark in my own soul. It's One of them is in verse 13. It says, If we believe not, yet... He 
abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. I just find that a bullwink. He abides faithful. Sometimes people complain to me, those brethren over there, they're not really being faithful. Yeah, it could be true. I wouldn't want you to look at me for faithfulness, brother. But there's one who is the faithful and true witness. He abides faithful. He always will be faithful. You can count on him. He cannot deny himself. God is God, and God is faithful. And to me, that's a bulwark. Let's hold on to it in these days that we live in. The other one that I find as a bulwark here, before we go through this chapter, I just wanted to point these two out, is in verse um, 19. And it's the first line of that verse says, Nevertheless, he's been talking in the verses previously of Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred in saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. But notice what he says then, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God is sure. You know, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were unfaithful, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and to take over the country and he destroyed the temple and he broke up the foundation so that when they came back in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah they had to relay the foundations remember in the New Testament the foundation is never removed it's firm you can count on it what is that foundation it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, that it is the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So it's the scriptures that God has left us in the New Testament that are the foundation work. And it stands firm. It hasn't been removed. You might have to dig down through your own thinking sometimes to get to the foundation but it's there and it's been such a consolation to me to realize that dear young people here's the two bulwarks i want to leave you in this chapter first of all he abides faithful the second one the foundation of god stands sure i'd like to go back to the first part of the chapter because we have Timothy, a young man given different figures of the believer in this chapter. And there are figures that we know in life commonly. Verse 3 is the soldier. Verse 5 is the athlete. Verse 6, the husbandman. Verse 14, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 15 the workman, and verse 19, uh, I'm sorry, verse 20, vessel, and verse 24, the servant. They're figures that we know in life, and they're all put there by the Apostle Paul for us to learn lessons. But before he begins with those, I just want to comment on verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What is it will make us strong? It's not, brethren, being legalistic and setting down rules and regulations. That's not going to make us strong. It's to enjoy the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That will make us strong. And I find that very tremendously beautiful. You know... Grace touches the heart, and the heart is the mainspring of Christian life. If I lay down some rules and regulations, that doesn't touch your heart. I'm sorry, you're, it's not going to have much power over you. But it's when 
we have, understand the grace that is in Christ Jesus that we will be enabled to go on even in days of ruin. And then verse 2, he talks about faithful men. Notice, there's four generations in verse 2. The things which thou hast heard of me, the Apostle Paul, number one, Timothy heard of him, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, that's the third generation, who shall be able to teach others also. That's the fourth generation. What kind of man, men does God use to carry on his testimony? He doesn't say, Timothy, you look for some really good, eloquent ple preachers. No, he doesn't say that. What kind of men? Faithful men. What's a faithful person? It's one who is obedient, who does what he's told. That's a faithful man. And that's the kind of men that God will use in the Christian testimony. So we have illustrations now in verse 3 and 4 of a soldier. What's the number one lesson a soldier has to learn? Obedience. Obey. You know, in Bolivia... They're used to military governments sometimes, and let me tell you, you hear about some things that happen. One of the brothers told me he was a student in a university, and the military was in power. It wasn't a democratic government, and they came into the university to round up some of those students because they were giving them trouble, and he was one of them. And he says, the chow was terrible. So he said he took his plate of food and just kind of carefully put it under the table and dumped it out. So he thought nobody would see him and he put it back on the table. To his chagrin, one of the sergeants saw him do it and came up to him and said, you didn't like the food, eh? No, sir. And so he signals another Soldier to come, bring three plates of food. And they put them down in front of him. And then he said, bring a half pint of kerosene. And he pours that into those bowls of soup. Now you eat those three plates. And he had to eat the three him with the kerosene. <laughs> he says, the next morning I was first in line and I liked that stuff. Well, he learned what it was to obey. Sometimes it doesn't seem reasonable. But brethren, when God speaks in his word, learn to not reason with what God says. Learn to obey. So important. The next one is that he speaks of is in verse uh, 5 is an athlete. If a man... Also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. In other words, if you're going to run a race, you've got to do it according to the rules of the race. You can't just say, I'm going to cut across the middle and I'll be there first. You can't do that. You have to respect the rules of the race. God has principles in his word you can't ignore. There are people who just say, oh, that was for the Corinthians. That doesn't apply to us now. You can't do that. When God has said specifically in the book of Corinthians to the church that is at Corinth and to all those in every place that call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, how important it is to learn simple obedience to the word of God. If you want to be used by the Lord, you've got to remember to respect God's principles of his word. Then we have the husbandman in verse 6, or a farmer. Farmer, a husbandman that labors, it says here, must be first partaker of the fruits. But really the thought is he must first labor to be partaker of the fruits. The new translation gives that that way to understand it. In other words, you're not going to have immediate results. 
How long does it take to produce a crop here in Walla Walla? I don't know who's a farmer yet here. Is there any farmers left? Uh, let's see. Ron, where are you? How long does it take to produce a crop of wheat from the time you plant it to the time of harvest? Ten months. Ten months. Wowie. Okay, so you don't get discouraged after two or three months so you don't have a crop yet? <laughs> no, and that's the way it is in the things of the Lord. Don't think you're going to get immediate results. Be patient. So Paul says to Timothy here, notice in verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. In other words, in these illustrations, these natural illustrations, there's a lesson to be learned. And so he says in verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. I used to not be able to understand why did he put that verse there. But it's come to me this way, and I believe this is the thought there. The Lord Jesus, at the end of his life on earth, it appeared to be complete failure. How many disciples he have? Twelve disciples. Ooh. Three and a half years and only twelve disciples? One of them was, a, was false. The other eleven took off and ran. And he was left completely alone. He condemned. No one stood up for him. It looked like his life was a complete failure. Remember, Timothy, Jesus Christ of the seed of David, raised from the dead according to my gospel. In other words, God's answer is not in this life. God's answer is in resurrection. I know that's so important to remember. Even the Apostle Paul, it was the same way. We've already said it. Looked like his life was a complete failure. But Paul told Timothy, don't be ashamed. No, it's worthwhile. God's answer is in resurrection. And in that resurrection day, when we stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, I am certain if you have lived in view of that day, that Paul talks about in chapter 1, verse 12, you will not be ashamed. But I fear sometimes that we get so occupied with material things, we are so busy, we don't have time to use our gift that God has given us for the good of other fellow believers. Let's stop and let's think about it, dear young people and older ones too, each one of us, how important it is to live in view of that day. Well, we come down to verse 15 and we have another uh, illustration of a believer. It's a workman. Study to show thyself uh, proved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, there's, in Scripture, it says there's Jews, there's Gentiles, there's the church of God. There's different people groups in Scripture. And when you read the Scriptures, remember the people group he's addressing. In Psalm 150, it says to praise the Lord with all kinds of musical instruments. You brethren, why didn't you have some in musical instruments in here to praise the Lord. That was written to the Jewish people, and that was very proper and right in its day. But when you come to the New Testament, you never find in the church musical instruments used. There are two instruments that are spoken of, the heart and the lips. Those instruments we are to use and praising the Lord. But beyond that, we are not to use musical instruments. We are to praise God in spirit and in truth. I like that because it's in spirit because God is a spirit. 
in truth because it is according to the revelation of God that we have in Scripture that we worship Him. Oh, how wonderful it is to understand these things that are precious, brethren. So to put things in their place is to be a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Another thing I think that is often mentioned in Christian circles is the question of tithing. You earn $100, 10% is God's. 90% is for you. But you know what? In the New Testament, we find that tithing is never practiced in the church. Why not? You know why? Because 100% is God's. And we are just administrators of that which God puts into our hands. So if I say 10% for God and 90% for me, I'm robbing God of 90%. Careful what you do. It's all God's, and we are to use it for him. So it's rightly dividing the word of truth, how important those simple things are. And so that's to be a workman. Now in verse uh, 19, 20, and 21, we have the question of being a vessel and it's talking about a great house. And in that great house are all those that name the name of the Lord, the name of Christ, it says in verse 19. And if you name that name, you are responsible to depart from iniquity. And so in that great house, there are many vessels, vessels of gold and of silver and of wood and of earth. And it says some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, a man purge himself from these. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. In other words, if I'm going to be a vessel that God can use, I need to be separated for him. I sometimes use the illustration, a sister is washing the dishes after a meal in her kitchen. Here's all the dirty dishes in one side. And then there's the water with the, I guess everybody has dishwashers now, but if you do it by hand, while well, you have the water with soap in it and then rinse water and then a place to put the ones after they're washed. So here I'm going to take up a dirty one and I wash it and I rinse it off. Now it's nice and clean. Shall I put it back with the dirty ones? You're going to say, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Why do you tell me to not do that? It's just going to get uh, dirty again. And so here we have now, we've washed a lot of dishes, and we got a nice clean, clean bunch over here. Pick up a dirty one over here and put it with the clean ones. What is the sister of the house going to say? No, don't do that. Don't do that. Why? You're going to get them dirty, and we want them clean. Brethren, things contaminate in that great house of profession, and we need to know how. It's not a matter of saying we're a bunch of better people. That's not the point. The Lord help us, because when the Lord comes into his house and he wants to use a vessel, he's going to look for one that's clean. I hope I'm clean. I know I get contaminated sometimes. And I have to be washed to be a vessel, meet for the master's use. The Lord help us in that. Another point in verse 24, we have the servant of the Lord. And he says he must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Oh, brethren, may that be the character of our lives in meekness, instructing those that impose themselves. Don't get this ornery, cantankerous spirit in criticizing others. The Lord help us in this. I just do want to mention a couple more things before we go on to the gospel meeting. But in chapter 3, we have... Uh, 
the perilous times of the last days. And these are pretty easy to see that we are in these times. Interesting. Notice verse 2. Men shall be lovers. What's number one lover? Of their own selves. Wowie. Does that ever characterize our culture? And then it says the second one, covetous. New translation puts it, lovers of money. And a little later down, in verse 4, it says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Are there lovers? Yeah, these people are lovers, let me tell you. They love their own selves. They love money. They love pleasure. But there's no love of God, nor of God's people. Tragic. But this is the characteristic of the day in which we live. Brethren, the Lord help us. I have to say, as I travel between Latin America and the United States frequently, I have to say, and I've said this in a number of places, that what I really believe is killing the Christian testimony in this country is the principle of pleasing yourself. I've got money in my pocket. I'm going to do what I like. And don't you criticize me. I'm going to do what I want. I've got the rights to do it. That's killing the Christian testimony. And since I've been going down to South America, I, I just have to say, brethren, it's not what I've done. First time I went down, there was only gatherings to the Lord's name in Peru and Bolivia. Now there is in Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, uh, I should say uh, Brazil, and Paraguay. And I, I haven't done it. It's been the Lord that has done it. And I just say, why is there such blessing down there? Because people know how to self-sacrifice. It's not self-pleasing. It's self-sacrifice. That's the principle of Christianity. The Lord Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself? Why in the world do you want to deny yourself? That's what's killing us. Because we want to please ourselves. Lord, help us, brethren. I, I have to confess here. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody out there. I have to point the finger at me because we are living in this culture. And it's a strong current that affects you if you're in it. And I'm in it. And I confess that I've been affected by it. But I think the best thing we can do is to recognize it and to confess it to the Lord and ask Him to help be overcomers. Yes, these in the last days are lovers of their own selves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. But I think it is so beautiful how he ends the chapter. He talks to Timothy. He says, verse 10, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, not only his teaching, but his manner of life corresponded to it. Purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. She came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Brethren, we don't know much about persecution in this country. Our brethren in other parts are passing through severe persecution. We need to remember them in our prayers, if nothing else. Brethren, in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, Muslim tribes are coming into towns at night and slaughtering Christians. It's incredible what's going on. You know, there is a list of nations in this world that persecute Christians, and Nigeria has gone way up on that list. It's close to the top, if not at the top now. But there are others, and with the reports you hear of what's going on in those countries, brother, we don't know what it means to be a Christian very much. 
We have it so good, so comfortable. Lord, help us. Lord, stir us to be stirred up to pray at least for those dear brethren over in those other countries. Evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and have been assured of, and of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It means God breathed and is profitable. Even the Old Testament scriptures are profitable. Don't stop at just the new. The new talks about the church. That's the main focus in the New Testament. But all scripture is profitable. And so we go back to the Old Testament. That which refers to Israel and those faithful men of God in the Old Testament. And we learn all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, which means teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. It means complete, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I just want to point out a couple things in chapter 4 before we close. In verse 1 it says, I charge thee, Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who sh shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction. And here's this exhortation we talked about before. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. You know, brethren, I think it is so important to keep a gospel focus in our ministry, in our assemblies. It keeps us down to the basics. It's important. And our assembly in Lawrenceville, we had the privilege uh, that COVID had shut it down for a while. We were hoping to get back in, but into a state prison there. And those of us that go find that when you talk to those men, you don't have to tell them they're guilty. They know it. But you've got to talk at their level, and I think that is healthy. Sometimes in meetings we talk at a different level. And sometimes young people are not exactly sure what we're talking about. And I think if you get into gospel work, you have to talk at the level of the people you're talking to. And it's helpful. I find it very helpful to keep down to reality. So do the work of an evangelist. And he says, I'm now ready to be offered. We mentioned that late earlier. The time of my departure is at hand. Notice verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all them that love his appearing. Just want to point out in verse 7 that he says I have finished my course. I like to compare that with the Lord Jesus. In John 17 the Lord Jesus says, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. I think he's the only one that will be able to say, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Paul could say, I've finished my course, but all of us have failed in one way or another. We can't hold up ourselves, brethren, as being faithful. There is one who has completely failed, faithful. He could say, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I must say, brethren, life is short. I left here, Walla Walla, 60 years ago this year. I can't believe it. I don't know how you look at me, if you look at me as an old guy or what. I don't feel old. 
I feel young. But that's the way life is. That's the way time is. It's very relative. So young people, take advantage of the years you have now. Use them in view of that day, not of this world's day. Let's just pray. Father, thanks so much for thy precious word. The recommendations, the instruction we have there. Help now our dear brother Josh as he preaches.